So this is the the fourth I curriculum workshop. Um, I know you guys had some on call cases with like I think some retinal detachment and doppelmitis, some GCA. Um, we had a retinal overview, so figured it'd be a good idea to talk about some glaucoma conditions and kind of talk about a different area that hasn't been covered uh, to date in any of these workshops. So just briefly, the um, agenda for today, we'll go over two quick cases with some um, teaching around some glaucoma points as well. Um, then we'll go over some like high level overview of common glaucoma conditions. <clears throat> these will be more so just as you guys enter some of your rotations and everything, to at least have kind of heard about some of these conditions, have a general idea what it is, have a little bit of an approach. It by no means will be an in-depth thing, but at least if you're seeing kind of on your schedule, there's a, a person with primary open angle glaucoma, for, for instance, at least you have an idea what it is, uh, what to expect and what to look for. So that's kind of the goal of that last kind of rapid fire third section. And then we'll open things up for some question and answers. Again, feel free to interrupt if you guys have questions. Like to make this uh, it, it relatively interactive. We'll kind of ask some things like um, throughout. So feel free to, to unmute, turn on your camera and, and get involved. Uh, so we'll start with some, some cases. Uh, so first one, so the first setting, you're in the glaucoma clinic. So you're a med student on uh, one of your clerkship rotations. Uh, you're in glaucoma clinic, and you have a new referral for from an optometrist. Uh, and essentially, all you have is a 63-year-old male of Scandinavian descent referred for glaucoma assessment. And the patient has no concerns. Uh, he said he's just here because someone told him to be here, but he hasn't noticed any changes to his vision. Past medical history, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and GERD, uh, no past ocular history. Does have a family history of glaucoma with some siblings having glaucoma. Visual acuity, 2100 in the right eye and 2030 minus two in the left eye. And you're, you're a keen medical student doing a pupil assessment and you think that there might be a, a small relative afferent pupillary defect or RAPD for short. Um, you, you check pressures and you get 34 and 29. Um, I guess first thing like, have you guys heard of an RAPD? Do you guys know what an RAPD is or, or what that may signify? Don't have to be shy. There's no wrong answers, just learning learning environment. I see a thumbs up. Iman, you want to be the brave one to speak? <laughs> I think there's some answers in the chat. Oh yeah, okay. When I'm screen well. streaming, I can't see the chat. So maybe if someone can uh, read that out for me, that'd be that'd be great. Sure. So Danielle said uh, it stands for relative afferent pupillary defect. Uh, Hamza said optic nerve damage. Tala said relative pupillary defect, and then Danielle said can signify optic nerve damage. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, exactly. So th that's the key thing. So one, the things to highlight: it's a relative defect. So if both eyes have optic nerve damage, you're not going to see that sign, but if one eye is worse than the other, um, then you will have that RAPD. And classically, it is an optic nerve kind of, you see it due to some damage to the optic nerve. It doesn't really tell you if this is acute, if this is chronic, where in the optic nerve, you can't localize a lesion um, just off of just the RAPD itself. It can help with localizing, but it, it just essentially tells you uh, there's either some optic nerve damage or some like very, very significant kind of retinal damage as well. We'll, we'll show up with like a, a smaller RAPD, but um, people typically think of this in like your neuro clinic with like your optic neuritis, your uh, ischemic optic neuropathies, but glaucoma as well is uh, optic neuropathy. And so, especially in the more advanced cases, you can definitely see an RAPD. Um, and yeah, pressure is high, 34, 29. Normal range is 10 to 21, um, but... Uh, Again, everyone has a, a different normal versus so some people may have glaucoma damage with lower pressures. Some people may have no glaucoma damage with higher pressures. It also varies a lot during the course of the day. So in an average individual it will vary kind of between two to six millimeters of mercury per day. But in those with glaucoma and with certain types of glaucoma, it can vary a lot more kind of like 10 millimeters per day. Um, so one kind of static measurement doesn't tell the whole thing, but it, it's definitely a, a, a piece of the puzzle. Um, okay, so uh, now you take a look in with the slit lamp and then you're trying this gonio lens as a, as a keen med student, but anyone care to comment on what they're seeing um, on an exam here? So one, we just have like a slit beam. You can kind of see the pupil, the iris margin here, and then this is a, a gonio view. So 
Gonio is a special lens that's used in kind of glaucoma clinics primarily where it helps you see the structures of the angle or, or where part of where the um, aqueous humor in the eye will be draining out of. But um, any thoughts as to what, what is being seen in, in these images? And again, yeah, if there's anything in the chat, Iman or, or Milan, or someone can just read those out, that'd be helpful. No, nothing. Okay. Uh, we have someone saying pupil is dilated despite the light, question mark. Okay, good thought. Yeah, that, that's a good thought. Um, what I guess this picture is trying to highlight is if you look at the pupil margin here, can you guys see my mouse as well? Um, you see this white like dandruff-like material. So that you won't see on a normal eye exam, but it's very high yield in glaucoma um, because that is associated with what we call pseudo exfoliation. Um, so pseudo exfoliation is one of, or if not the, the most common cause of secondary open angle glaucoma. So pseudo exfoliation glaucoma. And one of the, the classic signs, even on a pre-dilated exam, you can see all this here. And similarly, when you look in the angle, this line that the arrows point to, this is honestly probably kind of high level for like med student what's expected, but that's also the goal here. And you guys will impress when you're on, on your electives and rotations, but you're seeing what we call a sample lazy line, which is an extra line that you're seeing in the, in the, the drainage structures that you'll see in the types of pigmentary glaucoma. And so you're now thinking along the lines that this patient has either pseudo, like either some type of pigmentary glaucoma when you see the, the gonio structures, and then when you're looking um, at the pupil margin there, you see all this dandruff material, now you're thinking pseudo exfoliation. And if you think, if you remember back kind of the, the, the first slide, we talked about a Scandinavian person who was referred to you, and you typically see pseudo exfoliation glaucoma and those with Scandinavian descent. So things just to keep in mind um, when you're just reading through the referral, little hints about what may be going on. So we'll, we'll continue on. And now you dilate the pupil and you can see all this material here. And so you, you have this classic, what we call like a bullseye sign. And so you can see that on, on the anterior capsule here, another great example of, of the bullseye here. And this is what we call when you retroilluminate. Um, and so you, you, you retroilluminate um, here and, and you can again see that same bullseye sign and, and that is very classic for, for pseudo exfoliation. Um, now you, you dilate up the patient um, and you can see, I guess, a couple of things. So one, a, a glaucoma, um, as you guys are probably aware, a disease of, of the optic nerve. So you, you primarily will focus on the optic nerve. Obviously, you're going to do your whole eye exam, but th these are kind of some focused images of the optic nerve. So here we can see right eye, left eye. And classically, what you'll look for is what we call the cup to disc ratio. Um, specifically, we're looking at the, the vertical cup to disc ratio. Um, and, and, and that's something that you'll see kind of during your, your glaucoma clinics and everything that um, you're, you're monitoring to seeing the damage that's being done to the optic nerve. Um, so here, this is if you kind of look at where the, the, the cup is versus the whole disc, so you can look at the cup to disc ratio in this eye, somewhere around 0.7, somewhere in that ballpark. Left eye, not as bad. It's kind of a smaller cup to disc ratio here. Um, and you could probably say, again, it's tough with pictures, but there might even be a little bit of color here in, in this image as well, um, indicating some type of chronicity to the optic nerve damage. Uh, so next, you, you get some testing done. Um, so th this is, again, a high-level overview of some of the common things that you'll see in glaucoma clinic, just so that it's not super overwhelming. I remember my first time as a med student, you're like, what are all these colors? What, what is going on here? It's, it's not something that you are taught in medical school. Um, so it's a, it's a good idea to have some, some familiarity to it. So um, this here you have um, OCT images and you're, they're taking the OCT. Um, here you can see it's kind of centered on the optic nerve uh, and then they're, they're giving you the thickness uh, of each of the different sections and they have that compared to kind of age standardized normal ratios for um, the different populations. And so again, very simply, and it's not just as simple as this, but but green is normal, so, so no thinning. Yellow is some, red, more. Um, and so you can use that as kind of like a quick screening uh, to see if there is some optic nerve damage in certain individuals. Um, and so you can see in the right eye, there's, there's more thinning here compared to the left eye, uh, which is more green and, and the numbers are within normal limits. So this is one good on your initial assessment and then two, also for, for tracking things over time to monitor progressing progression 
uh, if you're seeing more thinning or more damage to the optic nerve. And oftentimes you'll look for what we call like structure function, um, th things are like correlating. So uh, if you see that there's thinning superiorly on the optic nerve, that will control your inferior visual field. And so then you also wanna look at the in inferior visual field, or at least your, your total visual fields, but you wanna see if those correlate there. So you can see in this image here, um, you can see an inferior visual field defect. Um, and, and there's different patterns for visual def defects. This one is probably a bit more of what we call an inferior altitudinal visual field defect. Um, you can see that in, in, in the right eye here, whereas the left eye, um, no visual field defect, which is kind of in keeping with the better vision, um, better OCT markers here, and, and a, a healthier optic nerve appearance that we're seeing uh, on examination. Uh, so that, that's a little bit of an overview. Um, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, just to orient yourself here, um, you kind of have your, your blind spot. Um, and then, yeah, there's more details about grayscale pattern deviation. You don't have to worry about the, all that right now as a med student right now, just kind of know you're, you're looking from the patient's perspective, black, obviously areas that they're not seeing. Um, if, it's, if it's white, th those are areas that they are seeing well, and then gray in the middle. It's obviously a little bit more complex, um, but you can worry about that a little bit later on, but just to have a little bit of an, an orientation. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Any questions at, at this point? I know it's a lot of information. Feel free to shout things out or ask any questions. So far the chat's clear, so. Okay, okay, sweet. Um, let's keep going. So, um, yeah, in terms of management, what, what do you do in this clinical setting? So one, obviously, you want to discuss the diagnosis diagnosis with the patient. Um, so in this case, they have pseudoexfoliation glaucoma um, in their right eye, um, and they have some signs of pseudoexfoliation in their left eye, but you're not seeing any of the optic nerve damage. But their their, their pressure was, at, from what I recall, um, I think higher in that eye as well. So you want to discuss all this with the patients, and generally, your approach to treatment, um, you you want to start conservative and then go more aggressive as needed over time. Um, and, and that's generally how you approach things in, in ophthalmology or in, in medicine in general. But for glaucoma, you typically tend to start with um, some topical drops. So those would be IOP lowering drops. I'm sure you guys have kind of heard a little bit about that. Um, another option is some laser treatment. Um, that can be either first line, it can be in addition to drops, or it can be for patients who fail drops or who, whose pressures aren't being controlled um, kind of as an adjunct. And that is to have kind of like a, a discussion with the patient to chat with them about where their pressure is. And then obviously the, the last step for glaucoma would be some type of surgical correction to try and uh, decrease the pressure in the eye. So in this kind of hypothetical case, the patient wanted to start with topical therapy. And then the question always is like, what pressure are we aiming for? Like, what is our target pressure? Um, and, and these are good things to kind of have an idea of when you're in clinic. Um, these are from the Canadian glaucoma guidelines. But um, you, you would classify their glaucoma as early, moderate, advanced, uh, based off of a combination of their, their whole kind of testing. So their, their, their presentation, their, their visual fields, their OCC of their nerve, um, their cup to disc ratio, their pressure. That's, again, we can get into that at a different point. There's, there's obviously so much in, in glaucoma, but generally speaking, you have early, moderate, advanced. With early kind of glaucoma, your, your goal is to target a pressure of less than 21 with at least a 20% reduction from baseline. A moderate would be to target less than 18 with at least a 30% reduction from baseline. Uh, advanced less than 15 uh, with a, a reduction of at least 30% from baseline. And then you have this glaucoma suspect, which I'll, I'll briefly kind of touch on, but those are people who you get referred like, do they have glaucoma? Do they not have glaucoma? Um, like, and, and you're not quite sure, or, or patients who have, say, like ocular hypertension, um, who have high pressures but no glaucoma damage. Typically, from that, you you want to then target a pressure of less than 24. Um, and there's kind of a big trial that everyone quotes, or the the OATS trial or ocular hypertension treatment study, which which found that targeting that pressure there um, tends to have benefits down the line. Um, obviously, won't get into too much detail, but um, that's kind of your, your general framework when seeing these patients with um, glaucoma. Then another question uh, that always comes up is like, well, what, what drops do I use? It's, it can be quite overwhelming, even as like a, a resident, there's so many, so many drops. Um, 
what do I, first of all, it's like, what are all these drops? There's, there's so many, it's hard to keep track. And then which ones do I go with? Um, but generally speaking, you break them down into classes. So um, first you have your PGAs or prostaglandin analogs. Um, and so for those of you that have spent time in clinics, you'll know those tend to end in, in PROS. So your latanoprost, bimatoprost, travoprost. Um, and those you, you the kind of the studies have shown you have a 30% decrease approximately in infraocular pressure, which you'll note is the highest amongst the, the drops. And uh, the prostaglandin analogs tend to be first line um, in most cases, obviously, it, not always, but that tends to be kind of your, your go-to first line drop. Um, another class, you have your beta blockers. So your timolol, classically, your alpha-2 adrenergic, um, so your, your bromonidine, um, your beta-1 blocker, sure, that's part of your beta blocker, I guess, your uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So you can have your topical drops, so your dorzolamide, benzolamide, um, but also classically, you may see um, in oral form or like the, the pill form of the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, so your, your diamox or your acetazolamide, um, that can sometimes be used as well. Um, you'll see that a lot in, in kind of more acute situations, but something to keep in mind. Um, so you have the topical or oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And then the parasympathomimetics, um, so your pilocarpine, that tends to, that's a kind of an older glaucoma drop. Uh, it's not used as frequently um, anymore, but it is kind of a tool to have in those certain circumstances. Um, and, and you can kind of see the, the rough decrease in, in pressure. So um, just kind of a, a handy chart to at least have in the back of your mind, especially when patients are kind of telling you what drops they're on or you're unsure what drops to be starting patients on to have a, a rough idea. Briefly, the, the drop stuff is can be a whole lecture on its own, um, but some... Good thing to know about side effects anytime you're prescribing any drug to patients uh, or any contraindications. So for the prostaglandin analogs, um, big one to know you can have like lash growth, you can get some pigmentation. It's also pro-inflammatory, so um, kind of textbook answer would be to avoid them in cases of uveitis or any type of intraocular inflammation. Uh, and same, they, they can reactivate your your herpes simplex or your your your, your HSV kind of cases. So um, things to keep in mind. Um, other things, so your beta blockers, um, obviously you guys are still in, in, you guys are in med school, so you know all the beta blockers, um, but you, you, you want to avoid those in patients with asthma, bradycardia, heart block, and acute heart failure. Uh, your alpha-2 uh, adrenergic drops, um, big thing is to avoid them in those who are less than six or patients weigh less than 20 kilos because um, it can cause apnea, so uh, a big thing to know. Um, and then your topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors if patients have a sulfa allergy to keep that in mind. And then orally, you have to just keep that in mind with their other potential um, diuretics that they may be on, specifically to be careful of thiazide diuretics. Um, so just keep that in mind. Last thing here, just about drops, just because I know it's always a question that students are always asking lots about, just because it, it's such a kind of confusing, overwhelming topic. Um, there's also combination drops. And so you'll you'll commonly see those in clinics. So I've bolded some of the, the, the big ones. So Combigan tends to be used quite commonly, which is a combination of timolol and bromonidine. Um, Cozopt also used quite commonly because it's preservative free. So in patients who have uh, maybe dry eyes or um, who struggle with some of the, the preservatives and the other drops like Cozops, um, they do have a preservative free option. So that's something to keep in mind. And then Simbrinza and Duotrap also bolded those um, just because with Simbrinza and Duotrab, you can get all four classes of drops just with those two medications. So um, that can also be a combo to start patients on um, as well if you're trying to hit them with all four classes, but just to minimize the number of drops they have to take. Uh, other things that we, we um, chatted about, so I said laser is an option. Um, so uh, with patients with kind of pseudoexfoliation um, or with any type of pigmentary glaucoma, so the, the laser procedure will work in the, the drainage system um, of the eye. So um, the trabecular meshwork drains some of the, the fluid out of the eye. Um, and so that will help promote kind of more drainage. Um, so that works well in patients with pigmentary glaucoma. Other thing to note that always comes up and is a classic thing like PIM question for med students is uh, what are your, your, your considerations for cataract surgery in this population or in patients who have pseudoexfoliation glaucoma or who has pseudoexfoliation, things to keep in mind are that they have weakened lens onules. So there's a risk of 
lens subluxation. So that's super, super key to keep in mind. And they also don't dilate as well. Uh, and again, feel free to kind of chip in with, with questions, comments, or anything like that. And then uh, some other things just about pseudoexfoliation glaucoma, just some, some general points. So uh, incidence is about two to 200 per 100,000, but it is much more common with increasing age. As I mentioned earlier, it has a higher incidence in the Scandinavian countries uh, due to that, the mutation in the, the LOX-L1 gene. It's actually a systemic disease. And so you have that fibrillar extracellular material that I showed in those earlier pictures, but that is deposited uh, in the skin, lung, heart, liver, and eye. Obviously, in ophthalmology, we care mo most about the eye, but it is a systemic condition. And it can be commonly asymmetric, um, even though it is bilateral. So to keep that in mind. And it is, as I mentioned, the most common secondary open angle glaucoma. We showed pictures of the classic bullseye pattern, uh, and, and that's something that you will most commonly see, and, and that's usually the, one of the easiest ways to suspect uh, pseudoexfoliation. We mentioned the poor dilation, and on gonioscopy, you may see that uh, sample lazy line or that extra line of, of pigmentation. The trabecular meshwork on the gonioscopy examination may also be super, super pigmented as well. So to end things off with pseudoexfoliation, uh, just with kind of recap of some of the, the key images. So uh, on the left here, we see the, the dandruff-like material around the pupil margin. Uh, here we can see the, um, again, the, the same fibrillar material on, on the zonules. We can see the bullseye sign here. And then we have normal um, or pretty normal, I guess, uh, a gonio exam. But you can see the your typical landmarks um, of your ciliary body band, your scleral spur, trabecular meshwork, and your Schwabe's line. And you can see that extra line that you get here in uh, pseudoexfoliation uh, glaucoma. Pseudoexfoliation is one of the most common causes of this extra line or the Santalazes line. So yeah, that was a, a, a lot of information on pseudoex. Uh, and I thought it'd be helpful then just to zoom out quickly. So firstly, just like basics, like what even is glaucoma? Uh, it's, it's a group or spectrum of diseases with a characteristic optic neuropathy. Classically, people think that it's, it's just high pressure is glaucoma. That's not necessarily the case. High pressure is a risk factor for glaucoma, but it, they're, while they are correlated, they're not directly correlated, and it isn't just high pressure equals glaucoma. You have to look at the whole, whole picture. Uh, and then ways that glaucoma is classified. So there's two main things. One is the angle open or closed. And so your gonioscopy examination will help you determine if the drainage system or the angle is open or closed. And then once you're in, you, if you go down the path of say the, the angle is open, you have primary or secondary. As with everything in medicine, primary when there's no identifying underlying cause, secondary there is. So we chatted about pseudoexfoliation glaucoma, other common secondary glaucomas might be your pigment dispersion, your uveitic, or many, many others, but this is just a, a very basic uh, overview um, or, or flow chart of some of the common causes of glaucoma. Um, so again, take home messages from this case for you guys. One, what, what glaucoma is, you can classify it as open, closed angle. In the open angles, your secondary open angles, your pseudoexfoliation is one of the most common ones, it tends to affect people of older age, classically kind of Scandinavian descent. You'll see that dandruff-like material even without dilation, sometimes on the anterior capsule, you may see it, um, that bullseye sign when dilated. And it is tends to be a, a, a more aggressive type of glaucoma compared to your classic primary open angle glaucoma. So yeah, that was a, a lot of info. Um, any questions? Uh, anyone want to jump in? Feel free. There's, there's no dumb questions, so feel free to ask any questions. No, everyone's a pseudoexfoliation expert. Unless there's a Melinda, I don't know if there's anything in the chat. I can't see it when I'm sharing screen. Yeah, nothing in the chat for now. All right, All right we'll, we'll keep on then. So second case, we're gonna switch things up. You're no longer in the glaucoma clinic. Now you're on call. And you, the emergency doc calls you saying like, hey, I've got an acute angle closure. Um, you'll see when you guys are residents, the emerge docs will think everything's an acute angle closure. Uh, so you take that with a grain of salt. Obviously, you see the patient very quickly. Uh, it's, it's definitely something that you can't sit on, but that, that's not always going to be the, the diagnosis. But they, they call you saying that that's what's going on. 
the, the patient reports having 12 hours of pain, red eye, nausea, maybe some vomiting. Uh, they're, they're saying there's decreased visual acuity and, and the eMERGE doc measured a pressure of greater than 50. Now you ask the patient about their past medical history. So they mentioned a bit of a vasculopath, hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, AFib, um, GERD as well. You ask them about their ocular history and they mentioned they have a history of a vein occlusion uh, in that eye. So CRVO, central retinal vein occlusion. Um, and they also have had cataract extraction done in both eyes. Their visual acuity, on exam today is 2400 in the right eye, 2050 in the left. And pressure is markedly elevated in the right eye. So 67 in the right eye, 15 in the left. And it, it's a very even hazy view to the pupil in the right eye. And that pupil in the right eye is, is quite sluggish. So keep all this in mind. And we'll show you some images here. Uh, any thoughts as to what, what we're looking at or what may be going on? No, okay, we'll, we'll run through it. So image on the left here, obviously external image of the eye. Um, you can see that the eye is, is quite red. It's an angry, red, hot eye. Something is obviously wrong. Uh, classically, if the pressure was high, there were, the, the cornea itself, so the, the front part of the eye here, would classically have a little bit of edema or swelling just because the pressure is so high. So that's usually a sign of acute high pressure in, in the eye. I couldn't find a, a great image of that. And then if you look at the iris here, you see all these red vessels. So those are what we call neovascular um, vessels. So not, not normal. In a, a normal healthy eye, you, you will not see those. That, that's something that you only see in kind of vasculopaths who in their eyes, their body, their eye for some reason has not had enough blood supply, whether it be from diabetes, uh, ocular ischemic syndrome, or in this patient's case, they had a previous vein occlusion, um, that the body has now tried to create all these new blood vessels. So um, their body has created the, these new blood vessels to try and perfuse the eye, but these blood vessels are not the good blood vessels. They're kind of fake, leaky, fibrotic vessels, um, and they wreak havoc in the back of the eye. I don't know how much that we talked about in last week's talk or whatever, the, the last talk about retinal conditions, but they can also come in the front of the eye. And so they can come here in the iris, you can see that. And then they can come also in the angles. Again, this is our, our gonio image and we can see new vessels that have grown into the angle. And uh, as we chatted about in the angles where fluid can drain. And so if you have something blocking that drainage, the pressure is gonna get very, very high. You manage to take a look into the back of the patient's eye. Uh, and, and here we can see what we, a, a kind of a classic central retinal vein occlusion image. Uh, textbooks often refer to this as what we call a blood and thunder image. Key things to note, so um, there's dilated and tortuous vessels. So if you look at these vessels compared to the normal healthy left eye, you'll see these are all dilated and tortuous. Um, and dilated and tortuous, you thinking now down the lines of a, a vein occlusion. If they're just dilated and not necessarily tortuous, that that's you're now thinking more ocular ischemic syndrome kind of classically, obviously not always, but these are just general things to keep in mind. Um, so we mentioned the dilated and tortuous vessels, and then you're seeing retinal hemorrhages in all four quadrants as well. So when you see that as well, you're now again thinking vein occlusion, um, and they can have some disc edema as well, in, in depending on the severity. But in the right eye here, we can see the previous CRVO versus a, a healthy left retina here. So um, this patient's pressure is obviously through the roof. Um, you can't have the patient at that pressure. Again, normal pressure, 10 to 21. If this guy is in the 60s, um, you can think about just how small the eye is. The pressure is going to be bursting through there. One, not only will they be extremely, extremely uncomfortable, so nausea, vomiting, terrible, terrible headache, but um, you're also going to cause a lot of damage in the eye. So a pressure of 67 will rapidly, rapidly cause optic nerve damage, and so you can't keep it that high. Your goal then is to bring down pressure kind of with whatever means you can. So um, you can give them kind of all the drops that we mentioned before. You can give them the Diamox, which is your oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitor to try and bring down the pressure. Um, in certain circumstances, you can do what we call an AC tap as well, where you essentially just take a small needle and you're just draining fluid out of the eye just because the pressure is so, so high. Uh, you need to bring it down at, with whatever kind of measures possible. 
So that's kind of the acute management that you, what you'd want to do for a patient who has a pressure that high. Definitively, um, they'll, they'll need uh, anti-VEGF therapy. So again, this is probably talked about in your retina talk. Uh, Anti-VEGF is the mainstay of treatment for a lot of your retinal conditions. So your center involved DME with vision loss, your, your macular degeneration, or your, specifically your wet macular degeneration, a vein occlusion with um, macular edema as well as treated with anti-VEGF. But in these neovascular glaucoma cases as well, you want to treat them with the anti-VEGF, which will help regress those new blood vessels. So they'll help get rid of those new blood vessels that are wreaking havoc at the back of the eye, at the front of the eye now too. They're all over the iris, they're in the angle, they're just taking over this eye essentially. So this uh, anti-VEGF therapy will help um, bring down some of those vessels. In, in some circumstances as well, um, the patients would benefit from, from PRP as well. Uh, oftentimes with the neovascular glaucoma, patients will need surgical intervention. So they may need what we call like a, say like a tube surgery um, to, to try and help facilitate drainage of fluid out of the eye. And additionally, in cases like this, when it's caused, caused by a vein occlusion, we also want to try and control your systemic vascular risk factors. So that's where um, having our, our colleagues in internal medicine or the patient's family physician, uh, endocrine, et cetera, et cetera, all of those specialists, having them help also control the patient's um, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, all of that as well. So uh, neovascular glaucoma, or NVG for short, is a common and severe type of secondary angle closure. So remember for the pseudoexfoliation, we were in open angle glaucoma. Now this angle is closed, right? Because from, from all those, those vessels, so you have now angle closure glaucoma, and it's a secondary one because we know the cause. So it's from the neovascular um, cause. So this is a, a secondary type of angle closure. This develops, as we mentioned, the set, uh, setting of ischemia, most commonly with an ischemic central retinal vein occlusion. So again, your CRVOs, they can be classified as ischemic, non-ischemic. Um, that's more kind of a retina talk. Um, with your ischemic ones, there's going to be more of that ischemic drive from the eye to try and create those new blood vessels. And in this case, you can get those the neovascular vessels that can wreak havoc. The next most common causes, as I mentioned, are the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, or PDR for short and OIS or ocular ischemic syndrome that we briefly chatted about as well. And it, it is related, as I mentioned, to the extent of non-perfusions in the retina. So when you have that ischemic drive, when there's enough ischemia that can happen from the diabetes or from lack of blood supply after the vein occlusion, then the body's going to try and create all this. And um, it, it can be a, a real mess for retina specialists, glaucoma specialists to try and kind of clean things up and salvage as much vision as possible. So. That's a little bit about NVG and a common case that you'll see uh, all the time on call. I think we always cause a, a called for like a query angle closure glaucoma anytime the pressure is high. I would say most of the time from, again, I'm, I'm just an R3, but the vast, vast, vast majority of the time it's either uh, NVG, like new vascular glaucoma, or it's a, a uveitic glaucoma that's causing the high pressure. It's not as frequently your, your classic pupillary block angle closure glaucoma that I feel like in med school, that's like hammered down you like all the time. Like you're always taught about pupillary block angle closure. I remember all my friends who wanted to emerge or even friends in like family medicine, they all knew about angle closure, but it, it isn't as common as uh, it would be made out to be. These are cases that I see uh, like much, much more frequently and um, at least from, from my experience thus far. So yeah, uh, questions about uh, NVG. Hopefully that, that made sense. We're all good. Um, okay, uh, then we'll move on. Just as I mentioned, just some rapid fire overview of common glaucoma conditions, just so that when you are in clinic or are in these settings, you've at least heard of them. The, the goal is obviously not to have a ton of information, but at least you, you, you know about it. So um, people call this POAG, uh, but primary open angle glaucoma. This is like your classic glaucoma. So this is your chronic, slowly progressive optic neuropathy, and it has characteristic patterns of optic nerve damage and visual field loss. This tends to happen over years, years, decades kind of thing, and the angles open, and this is your 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 classic glaucoma, like when you're thinking about glaucoma, it's, it tends to be people with their mind goes to is POAG. Risk factors for that is high pressure, age, certain races, um, thin cornea, obviously family history. Having a vein occlusion uh, obviously is a, is a big 
uh, risk factor for neovascular glaucoma, but also just for glaucoma in general. Uh, myopia is also a, a risk factor for glaucoma. The prognosis for primary opening of glaucoma is, is pretty good. Most patients retain useful vision uh, their entire life. Obviously, not everyone, and, and you'll see some of the glaucoma clinics. There can be some quite advanced, like debilitating cases, but um, prognosis tends to be better than um, for pseudoexfoliation glaucoma, or, or better than cases who have neovascular glaucoma. And again, like your your typical kind of like glaucoma approach, especially just when you're trying to learn basics and fundamental fundamentals, you want to start with a combination of either topical therapy, um, either some laser if the patient is interested in going down that route or if there's an indication for it. And then if that fails, then you can go to incisional surgery. And that's when you have your, your trabs, your tubes, or your, your MIG surgery. Um, but that, that tends to be your, your typical framework for glaucoma treatment. It was very briefly about what we call NTG or normal tension glaucoma. So again, this is where it's, it's key to, even though we know IOP is a big risk factor for glaucoma, they're not one and the same. And so you can have patients who have normal tension glaucoma, where their pressures are what is considered in normal limits, so within that 10 to 21 range, but they do have signs of optic nerve damage and visual field loss that is classic with glaucoma. Um, and so you can have that, but with normal pressures. Typically, that happens more commonly in, in the Japanese population. Um, a classic like pimp question that you may get from like staff or residents is they, these patients tend to have higher rates of disc hemorrhages. Um, there's some thought and thinking that it occurs in like vasospastic disorders or um, ischemic vascular disease or sleep apnea. Um, from what I've seen, that, that's not as well kind of solidified, but there, that is where a lot of the thinking is. And then the visual field defects in normal tension glaucoma compared to, say, a POI tend to be more focal, deeper, and closer to fixation. But again, your, your treatment is still similar. Like your, your goal that now is to reduce pressure. Um, and kind of like one of the landmark studies for this, the collaborative normal tension glaucoma study. So they found that even in this population, a 30% reduction in IOP reduced your five-year visual field progression from 35 to 12%. So big improvement in visual field progression by decreasing pressure. So um, again, similar approach to these patients, combination of drops, lasers, and then if needed surgery to try and, and lower pressure to their target pressures. We briefly mentioned uveitic glaucoma. Uh, so that's when you have uveitis or inflammation in the eye that can then also be associated with high pressures and with glaucoma. The reasons that uveitis can cause this is through either one or a combination of um, edema of the trabecular meshwork, inflammatory cells blocking the outflow of the trabecular meshwork. You can also have a steroid-induced or steroid response, high pressure. And classically, and again, a very common question that I find that seems to always asked or um, comes up on, on tests and stuff is, what are the types of uveitis that are associated with higher pressure? So you have your HSV, your HZV, something that we call Fuchs heterochromic erosiclitis. Um, where a, a kind of a, a distinct feature of that, um, that your, your, your iris will have a little bit of a different color, that's the heterochromic. Um, posner schlossman syndrome, where um, you get these, these rapid fluctuations in pressure. So pressure can go way up in the 50s, 60s, and then come back down. And it tends to have a little bit less inflammation than, than some of the other types. Your toxoplasmosis, um, JIA, so your, your juvenile... Um, a uveitis cases or your idiopathic arthritis, so juvenile idiopathic arthritis associated uveitis cases. So you'll see that in peds all the time. And also your, your pars planitis cases as well can be associated with high pressure. With these cases, you want to treat both the pressure and the inflammation in the eye. So a combination of the two to try and help maximize and preserve vision. And then last one here that you'll see um, very commonly is what we call pigment dispersion syndrome. So these are when zonular fibers rub the posterior iris epithelium, and then this can cause a release of the pigment granules throughout the eye, which can then obstruct your trabecular meshwork. So on examination, you'll, you'll classically see some pigment deposits on the endothelium. So the image in the top right here, you can see focused on the, the cornea, so specifically on the endothelium, which is the, the back layer of your cornea. You see all this pigment, right? And when it's aligned vertically like this, that's classic in a pigment dispersion syndrome glaucoma or pigment dispersion syndrome case. And this finding here, we call this a Krukenberg spindle. Sorry, Krukenberg spindle. 
Um, so you'll, you'll see that in these, these pigment dispersion syndrome cases. Oftentimes you also see pigments on the direct the meshwork, um, on the lens periphery. And when you retroilluminate, it'll highlight these mid peripheral iris transillumination defects in these cases as well. You'll see some posterior bowing of the iris. And it's because of that that they, get, they have such release of this pigment um, from this, when it contacts the zonular fibers. And your classic kind of presentation for this and the classic um, test question, you'll see this in younger myopic men. Obviously, not always, but that's the, the most common population for your pigment dispersion syndrome. And they can get these huge fluctuations in IOP, specifically after exercise um, or after some type of pupillary dilation, because this will cause some more liberation of the pigment. So I know there's a lot, a lot of info. Um, Want to just, again, look at the big picture. So we have glaucoma at the top, which is your optic neuropathy with your characteristic optic nerve damage, your characteristic visual field damage. Um, we know that IOP is a risk factor, but IOP does not, high IOP does not necessarily mean glaucoma. Then when you think about glaucoma, try and have these classifications in your mind. So first thing is the angle open or is the angle closed? So you can look at that. The gold standard for de determining whether the angle is open or not is through your gonioscopy assessment. Um, then after that, you want to look at is it primary or secondary, um, either open angle or closed angle. So we went over some of those causes. Secondary, the one, the big ones, so pseudoexfoliation, pigment dispersion, or uveitic. In your primary ones, you went over primary open angle glaucoma, normal tension glaucoma, and then your secondary closed angle. So we chatted about your your rubiotic, or this is your neovascular glaucoma as well. And if you think back to that that second case that we did. So that, that's essentially like high level brief overview of, of some of the common glaucoma conditions that you may encounter. And a good idea just as you're in, in medical school getting ready for electives and everything to have a, a rough sense of these common presentations.